Hi, I am Marianne, um, a clock director at KPF. And um, like many of our peers, we have joined the AIA and RIBA in efforts to design and implement carbon neutral buildings by 2030. And um, we are investigating every single possible path. And in this case, look very closely at materiality. Uh, we really wanted to see um, a real life uh, situation for this. And so we are working on a project that is a complex of existing buildings. Um, so very much um, about reuse. And also uh, with that project, we are introducing two timber uh, buildings. And um, so with the terracotta, we thought we would really try and investigate the life cycle of building materialities, um, finishes, as well as introducing elements of wellness. Um, more than anyone in the office, Darina Zlateva has researched the possibilities of terracotta probably the most. And uh, she is a very talented senior designer leading the team on this project. And uh, we'll tell you more about our terracotta investigations. Thank you. Um, so when we started doing this project, certainly it was a reuse project. We introduced mass timber. And mass timber is kind of a very well understood way of having a sustainable superstructure, floor, ceiling, facade even. Um, but when we moved into the lobby, we faced a bit of resistance. Um, in class A office lobbies, there's still this preference for marble. And um, we really had to make an argument in favor of terracotta. So um, the raw materials of terracotta, the clay part at least, is very sustainable. Um, but for the glaze, you end up having to use a ceramic frit. And that is typically made outside of the US and then shipped. So luckily, um, Andy Brayman was at this very moment uh, researching uh, using recycled glaze from post-industrial processes, so uh, lab equipment, um, and trying to figure out if this would be an, a good alternate for uh, alternate path for glaze development for Boston Valley. So at the same moment, we're also we also looked at the building materials pyramid, which is a complement to your food pyramid. And as everybody knows, you have to eat your veggies. So using wood already in this mass timber building really filled up your plate in a good way. Um, and we knew we were going to have to use aluminum and other metals elsewhere. So we really were trying to um, bulk up on that zero to one range of embodied carbon. So as you can see, terracotta fits well within that. It's a 0 0.4. Natural stone, actually, if you're close to a quarry, it's pretty sustainable. It's at about 0 0.5. Um, but when you're thinking about a specific marble that's very white and has very crisp gray lines that don't have any green or brown, <laughs> you, you kind of zero in on very few places on earth that can supply you with that. So, um, 1.1 is actually pretty conservative. This is an average over all the EPDs uh, of materials. And so um, we suspect it's much more, but, um, and especially if you're further away from it, it just drives up the embodied carbon. So um, having terracotta and then using that recycled glass glaze, which is 50% of a reduction from an original, from the original, um, is actually a very compelling story and a compelling argument. Of course, the real argument for terracotta over, na over natural stone is that it can take on any shape. And so what we wanted to do um, in the lobby is really create this integrated design that would take um, shape from, from a vertical into a horizontal ceiling application. And with that, take on all the different stuff that's in a lobby. So like your sprinklers, your speakers, your diffusers, the technical stuff, but then also client um, requests. So our client really wanted plants. So we incorporated a uh, plant cell. And then um, these floor plates are on the large side and those trend towards a more tech tenant, particularly on the West Coast. So we were asked to incorporate um, digital screens and a level of 
interactability. So um, you can see those cells as well. This is a very early rendering of the lobby as you're sitting um, uh, looking at it. So you have that seamless transition from wall to ceiling. On the left, you see a little detail of the plant cell and how it interlocks with the cell above it to create space for the plants. Uh, we'll show you more about that soon. Here you are seeing the whole um, extents of the elevation. So, you know, you can see all the cells are kind of working together. There's a robust grid. There's repeatability within each um, one of these types. I think in the end we have only, I think we have eight different cells that repeat. Uh, we 3D printed them and started to see what kinds of patterns could emerge by combining them next to each other. And then we also had to um, make sure that all the micro adjustments we were making in the interlocking actually worked the way they were supposed to. So you can see um, on the right, there's a cell that kind of cups out and that is a plant cell. Um, so you need to have space for all the plant material. So um, we were able to carve that out. So it pops kind of out, but the cell that's directly above it can't pop out as well because then you wouldn't have space for the plant. So that, that cell cups back. Um, towards the back of this, you can kind of see those digital screens popping out. And we had to do that so that we can optimize view angles for the digital screens. So in a way it's performative, um, but they kind of have to all work together. Um, these are some early studies that um, Andy sent us of his experiments. He sent us many more, like maybe three times as many, but the ones that we were thinking about um, were really the, grit, the blues and the greens. We had this notion that it would be amazing if this wall wasn't um, like a charcoal. It would make the plants really pop. However, we thought that might be a bit oppressive uh, over the <laughs> full extent of a lobby. And then white, certainly beautiful. You can accentuate, you can see the form and the light and shadow, but maybe a little bit too expected. So we um, honed in on the greens and the blues. We kind of had this idea that if we remap it in a smart way, uh, we could actually make something more out of it, which means that we made the plant cells green um, so that even if a plant dies, which as you know, in a green wall happens, uh, and there's also a time lag between when it you know, passes and it gets replaced uh, built by building maintenance. Um, anyway, that cell would continue to be green because the glaze is a beautiful green color. So um, that was kind of the start of our gradient. And then the blue is our digital screens. Um, and we picked that color because um, it would interact less with the light. So here we are, here we go, oh no, sorry. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, here we are in the Nanagon and um, you're entering this tunnel of terracotta. And we were thinking about this as a sensory experience where you would see changing light um, changing color, you would smell the different scents of the plants, and there would be an oral component because there would be embedded speakers, so maybe you're hearing some water or wind. Here you are panning across. And I think in this, um, in this view, you can really see the difference of depth that are achieved through the different tiles. Like the, the reason for having depth for a plant cell um, is complemented by um, the, the light module that's behind it that needs to curve back. Hi guys, um, for the next part, I will go through our prototypes. Basically, we have three types of cells that form up our entire feature wall. Um, the three types are A, digital screen, B, glazing windows, and C, plants. Cell A has several variations on the digital screen size, 
parameter that controls the size that could be anything like a uh, height or even specific passes. Cell B and C are staggered so that the glazing window with grow lights are read at the back of the plant. So this will cre create a really good growing environment for the indoor plants. Then I will explain each type of cell in detail. Next, please. Um, here are some diagrams show how we generate our final detail for fabrication for the cell A. First, on the left, there is a basic shape with a hole that sees the custom 3D print digital screen bracket. Uh, we will put a rectangular digital screen on this back. And then, in order to help minimize the weight and material and to make sure it maintains its original shape uh, and structural integrity, we keep the shell as one inch thick. And two ribs for future assembly holes are kept. Um, and finally, considering mold making and for easier demolding, we fill it as much corners as possible. And we taper the side walls um, with 1% to 3% inclination. The last section shows the two molds that could be used for both deep cast and gram press. Next, please. Um, so here are some fabrication photos from Andy. The top left is the original piece that made by the mill blue foam and MDF for the shape. And based on the, the shape, he made two molds and then cover them together, pour in material and wait until it dries. Next, please. So here we got the final prototype after coating with recycled glass glaze for cell A. Next, please. And the cell B is similar, has the similar process as for cell A. Um, minimize one inch thick wall and incorporate the glazing windows within a safe zone that won't ruin its structural integrity and rounded edges tapered walls for fabrication. Next please. And for cell B, we're highly inspired by Andy's artwork, the glazing windows. Uh, glazing span on the ceramic holes and lighting lights coming through. Really beautiful. Next please. For designing the glazing windows on the side of cell B, we made several studies. Um, considering the others might have more perforations near the edge, which might compromise the structural integrity of the, of the cell, we chose the top right one. Next, please. So the slide is, is about the mold making for cell B and its raw piece after demolding. Next one. And this one shows the process on window cutting by Andy's exquisite head making technique. Next piece. Um, here we got a coated final piece and the, the glazing window look really nice. We love it a lot. Next piece. And finally, the cell C, a type for plants. Finding is shaped by adding a 3D print plant pot, then modify the details by making sure we meet the fabrication requirement we set before. And next, the final one. So here's the final look of our prototype pieces. The glaze highlights the gentle curvature and integrates itself within the environment. We love it a lot. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Thank you, Chuchi, Darina, and uh, Marianne. And um, thank you for uh, contacting us about this project. We were really thrilled when we were asked to do some engineering consultants in this since we worked with, uh, with Boston Valley before we worked with Terracotta uh, kind of feature walls like this. Um, so we already had some ideas basically uh, as to maybe how the system could, could best work. What you see here uh, is a, a kind of typical attachment detail of a sort of uh, French cleat uh, or, or Z-clip uh, attachment between a um, vertical vertical Z girt that holds up um, a continuous rail onto which you then clip the um, um, the terracotta unit. That unit itself is held um, with something called an undercut anchor, uh, which is in this case made by a manufacturer called Kyle, um, which we were interested in looking at, uh, largely because of the uh, increased pullout strength you have in that sort of system over um, other kind of rain screen type attachments, um, and it also um, early on was kind of became clear. Yes, please. Thank you. Next, next, please. <laughs> it also became clear that because we would have such a large ceiling component, um, uh, meaning overhead kind of horizontal terracotta, we wanted to make sure that we had a uh, both a robust um, kind of pullout strength um, uh, study behind it as well as a uh, a clear kind of replacement strategy for the terracotta. And because these modules, as you've seen uh, from from the team before. Um, because the kind of undulating nature of them, 
and the number of cutouts on the back, there isn't really a, a straightforward way that you can attach this sort of continuous um, typical rain screen uh, rail uh, with a clip that, that you may have seen on other systems like the one used in one Vanderbilt, for instance, that was presented yesterday. Um, so therefore we went with, if you go next, please. Therefore we went with this um, anchor system, which basically is achieved by um, this kind of asymmetric uh, mill bit that drills down to a very specific depth uh, into the terracotta on the back. Um, then it's moved slightly, you see how it's kind of tilting, so that actually creates this undercut in one and the same movement. And after that, the, uh, the expansion anchor is inserted and finally it's, uh, it's expanded by this uh, this bolt that's uh, inserted into it. The difference to this video and what we are intending to do is actually we have a uh, we have a threaded rod rather than a uh, bolt to the head, but in principle it remains the same. And we also intend to uh, to explore kind of the idea of an oversized hole with washers here, so you can actually do some some final um, some final positioning kind of in the plane. Um, if you no, actually, let's look at this to the end because it has a, it shows kind of how the how the um, non-continuous clip what it looks like as well on the back of the panel. So, in difference to this uh, kind of typical demonstration panel that Kyle provided, um, we have a very complex backside to this with uh, with only very specific places because of the penetrations, etc., and the kind of routing of the um, uh, of the electrical and the drainage uh, systems where the holes can be, which is also sort of in favor of this system. So, if you go to the next slide, please. And the other advantage, of course, uh, of doing it in a potentially unitized fashion like this is that we can we can hang it fairly easily. We can uh, we can control the kind of geometry as it transitions from wall to ceiling in this um, curved fashion that that KPF have envisioned. We would still potentially explore the uh, possibility of curved Z girds on the back instead of facets like this, depending on how tight radii we actually have to we have to achieve. But that's sort of a um, you know something we will be looking at in the further study. Um, and then next slide, please. This should be my final one, I think. I know we're a bit over time. Yeah, so here you see this is kind of a quick look at how um, how this in principle, how this principle. Uh... Good morning. Thanks, Omar. Sure. Uh, my name is Alex Woodhouse. I'm with Element Architects. And uh, we also have speaking today, uh, Plamina Milusheva and Evgenia Plotnikova. Um, I'd like to also just mention the other participants, uh, Stephen Van Dyke and Scott Crawford and Vanessa Abin. Um, and then we worked with Walter P. Moore, uh, Norman Richardson and Laura Karna. And then uh, also uh, Jacob Barkin, James Renda and Brian Nickpon from the University of Buffalo. Uh, next, please. So uh, we started back in, in December with a, an open call for entries in the office and we had a, a wide variety of projects. Um, looking at both slip cast and extrusion. So in this case, actually rethinking um, the standard uh, Boston Valley dies and trying to think of new ways of using them. Um, and then also actually kind of rethinking the extrusion process. Um, in this case, uh, this is a proposed CNC extruder, which would um, actuate uh, a die manipulation. Um, just a quick video of one of these early prototypes in our office, um, just to see some of the other ideas we were looking at. Um, but ultimately, what we ended up deciding to go with was more of a slip cast route. Um, next, yep, so the, the idea was that uh, we had a few different projects that were proposing more of these volumetric freestanding uh, ceramic uh, assemblies utilizing one typical module. Um, on the side, we actually had a number of precedents which are um, consistent with other projects. Looking at um, on the bottom here, you can see different uses of terracotta as more programmatic elements, either as evaporative cooling, as Perkins Will had mentioned. Also looking at the um, more of a planted wall aesthetic. And then also looking at um, uh, biologic uh, reference points, like uh, looking at moss growing on ceramics and rocks. Um, also the, the nesting colonies of cliff swallows. Um, so then from, for the actual project we ended up going with, uh, we looked at uh, tiling of a 2D plane using a single module. Um, so of course you have the top three, um, your pure tessellations, but 
But then what was of more interest was actually the bottom row. I'm um, starting to look at other shapes that can be tiled um, in, a, in a uniform way using rotational uh, mirrored or translational symmetries. Um, so the module that we ended up choosing is called the P31M. It's a hexagon and it uh, has four sides of equal length and then the two remaining sides are of equal length. And if you look at this, this next image here, you can see that um, within that module type, there's a lot of variation. And uh, we ended up picking the, the bottom left as kind of our default cell um, organization. Um, so here's this, the, the typical cell arrayed. Um, and from there, so then uh, getting back to the, the, the project itself and uh, looking at more of a freestanding volume, uh, we, we extruded the cell and we then started to sculpt it a bit, pulling out the two outward faces um, to give it some more, more depth. Um, and then we actually tapered the waist, the, the middle section of the module. Um, this is a strategy for more of a freestand, or not freestanding, a uh, dry stacking assembly, um, which then kind of changed um, as the project developed. Um, and then lastly, we, we ended up uh, softening the form and trimming out the face. Um, one thing to point out on this slide, this is our kind of completed elevation, is to note the negative space that's developing between modules and then the spacer element, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, one, one study that Norman with uh, Walter P. Moore had performed was looking at how this overall assembly um, deflects as, as a uniform aggregation. So imagine this is three sides supported um, of course, with the ceramic, you would expect there to be a lot of load, and in this case, a deflection occurring uh, towards the base. But one thing to point out of interest is the fact that at the corners here, you actually have fairly low deflection relative to both the, the center base as well as the, uh, the sides. Um, so just an interesting result that occurred as we got into it. Um, and here you can see um, just a uh, rendered elevation of what this could potentially start to look like um, once you start to program the, the modules, whether it's uh, vines and, and organic plantings, or if it's becoming more of an inhabited um, volume with animals. And then just a, a possible more aspirational image of how this could uh, end up being deployed in more of a courtyard setting. All right. So once we settled on the three-dimensional form, we started to think through some of the detail of it, which was important for, um, for our concept. Uh, the first thing to figure out was uh, to work with Andy very closely to come up with a way to divide up this uh, fairly large volume into pieces for milling the master module. Since we were doing the milling um, ourselves, we had to take into account the Z capacity of, our, uh, of the element mill. And so this eight part um, uh, master module uh, was sent to Andy who reconstituted it uh, at the matter factory to build the uh, plaster mold for the slip cast part. And so here you can see some of the process photos of that, uh, the module. Uh, and this is the, the module as it comes out of the uh, full mold. Um, so uh, the next piece of this was to, to figure out how to develop the openings. Um, the opening was important for us uh, for a number of, of reasons. So we worked closely with our collaborators at Walter P. Moore to uh, work through how large the opening could be. Um, based on the structural analysis, uh, we realized that the waist of the piece is really taking all the load and in fact could take a stack that's at least 10 units high. Um, and so then we could actually do whatever we wanted to with the opening. Um, next. So at that point, we were able to design three different sizes that we felt um, supported our, our design goal, goals of some of the visual qualities of the piece. Um, what we really wanted to develop was a, um, a layered relationship between the exterior of the module, the interior showing through, and then the through view. Uh, and to actually develop a range of, of options as um, we have different openings on either side. And this is meant to be really experienced from both sides. 
and you can see uh, in the top uh, left photo the module as it comes out and then next to it uh, one of the openings. We initially had the uh, thought that we would develop a set of jigs for the openings but in working with Andy we determined that a freehand cut at the rough elevations that we had determined in our digital studies uh, would be the best way to go here. So the next important piece in our uh, detailed development was the surface texture. As we had studied some of the moss growth and some of the other um, uh, uh, biosystems, uh, we wanted to create a texture on the outside that, would, that could support some kind of growth. Uh, and so we started with some early studies uh, looking at different uh, textures and end up settling on this uh, radial twisted uh, system because we felt that it um, fit um, most closely with the uh, general design concepts of the project. There's a lot of sort of twisting and turning as part of developing the full system. Um, so then we were able to simulate the, um, uh, the line work uh, in RhinoCam, and that was really the only 3D view of it that we had because it only lived as toolpath. So the whole pattern is designed as part of just the milling process of, of getting the master module ready for it. It's not, it's not sort of a, a, a layer on top of that. And so, um, next. So then we, uh, the first time we were able to really see what the, the pattern would look like was uh, when, as we were milling the, um, the parts to send to Andy. And we had to actually think through uh, quite a few details. Uh, on the upper left, you can see that there's actually quite a bit of variation in the steepness of the part. So I have to think through how that texture would play out with the geometry of the, of the mill bit and the surface. And we also had to think through how the texture would line up across all the different parts that had to be reassembled together. So some, some fun kind of detailing there. Next. Um, and so this is the, the front and uh, back faces um, before we send those out to Andy with the other pieces as well. Okay, glaze. Um, for the glaze studies, we wanted to explore three directions originally. One is the crawl group, which will be creating this organic um, texture on the uh, overlaid with very digital um, texture that we milled. The second group will be um, the volcanic group, which you can see on the top right. Uh, that will be about creating a really expressive rough surface, substantially the moss could grow on it. And then the bottom row would show the groups uh, with a runny glaze that would really enhance the CNC mill texture by the glaze pooling into valleys and the peaks getting exposed. And also we wanted to um, enhance the overall shape of the module by creating a gradient, color gradient that would radiate from the opening um, from the rim outwards. Um, these studies are, were done on a relatively small pieces um, and sure enough, when you glaze the overall module and it gets through the firing, you get the unexpected results. So one of those results is, um, this is the crawl group. Um, and the apparently did use the bicolor, which was green sprayed over the white one. Um, in this case, the texture of the glaze itself sort of hides the, um, the CNC texture that we had. Second group is more um, the gradient idea. Here, the entire module is glazed. Um, versus the previous one where the waste was left unglazed. Um, you see the green gradient radiating from the rim and we see some of the uh, machine and how the glaze is pooling in these valleys to really enhance the texture. Um, some of the fabrication photos, uh, important to mention that one side of the module was made flat for the purposes that the module could stay um, in, a can, in a can on its own. Uh, but Andy did made a special pedestals um, to prevent the glaze uh, dripping onto, onto the shelves and to, to increase the stability um, of the unit in its standing position. And this is just some moody inspirational image how the glaze um, in our modules could look beautifully in a dim light um, water environment. Um, and another important component, component of the whole process was um, fabrication of the spacer. So uh, the aggregation is essentially modules come together with the spacers between them and then there is a, a hardware that goes, uh, that goes through. The spacers we selected to, to, to make out of um, rubber silicon material for its flexibility and also so there is some um, play when there is a modification of the shape of the modules occurring in the kiln so that we have some flexibility of the spacers to adjust to that. Um, so each module has six sides, therefore there's six um, sort of unique shape 
spacers. Um, we did cast, um, we did create the uh, mold, 3D printed them out of the nylon variant. It's a four, uh, four part mold. Uh, we did, before casting, we test different parameters of the silicones um, and sort of set along Dragon Skin 30, which was rigid, but at the same time soft enough. Um, and this is, you see a hardware, uh, which essentially three inch steel rod with some uh, steel washers and rubber washers. Um, we did meet at the park once we got the three modules from Andy, which we were super excited of, uh, meet at the park and then made the assembly and it worked. Um, some modules were held together sort of tightly. Let's see some photos. Um, and then this, uh, what you see in this picture is a negative space, uh, which is really artifact of the process. We didn't digitally model it, it just kind of happened. Um, and then it, it enhanced the overall um, sort of assembly and how the light comes through. There it is. And here's the team. Big shout out um, to our collaborator, collaborators at Walter P. Moore, Boston Valley, um, Andy Brayman, and, um, and the rest. Thank you. This is the end of the element presentation. Greetings, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Maciej Kaczynski from Studio Gang. I'm a project leader over here. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Claire, who's going to do the intro. Hi, everybody. My name is Claire Cahan. I'm a, des a design director here at Studio Gang. We just want to start by saying big thanks to Boston Valley Terracotta and the University at Buffalo for inviting us to participate this year. Uh, Maciej and I are presenting on behalf of a larger team here at our office. We're led by Jeannie Gang and Weston Walker who worked closely with us and the engineers at Walter P. Moore throughout the project. Um, to begin, um, at Studio Gang, we work on architecture and design projects at many different scales. Regardless of the scale or project type, one thing that our projects have in common is a process of material research and exploration. Uh, this includes both new and emerging technologies, and an interest in more vernacular craft and ways of working with a material and even forgotten ways of working with materials. We're really interested in understanding what things are made of, how material works, how, the, how it breaks, how it performs environmentally, and the cultural and historical meaning mate that materials carry with them. Our research and design process is iterative and hands-on. There's a lot of making and testing that happens behind the scenes, but it's always our hope that our built work is expressive of the materials we use. Uh, projects like ACAW are great opportunities to advance this research and to build the relationships with the experts. Um, that includes you know, material experts, but also the artists, craftspeople, community members, and engineers who you know, work with materials along with us. Uh, we really enjoyed working with Boston Valley Terracotta on this project. This is Rescue Company 2, a training facility for FDNY, which recently opened in Brown, Browns, the Brownsville neighborhood in Brooklyn. The windows and openings are, are articulated with red glazed terracotta. This is a public building, so durability was a primary consideration, but the red terracotta was also a reference to historic firehouses. Um, historic firehouses in New York often have this vibrant red terracotta framing the openings. Uh, and while we really enjoyed working with this material in this way, we were astounded by the complexity and sophistication of the clips and infrastructure hidden behind the facade, which was necessary to hold up the terracotta pieces. Um, and through our research, um, can you go to the next slide, Maciej? Through our research, um, we know that Terracotta is, um, isn't, is a popular facade material, and this isn't new. During Terracotta's golden age, um, it was used a lot, especially here in Chicago, on civil, civic buildings for ornamentation. And then if you go back to the Guastavino Mache. Um, but ACOP presented us with the opportunity to get to know Terracotta be beyond its facade application and really dig into the history. Not only can terracotta do more, we found, but it can do more things simultaneously. It can be a structure, fireproofing, and a, of course, ornamentation as well. And you see that here in Guastavino self-supporting interlocking terracotta compression arch. Um, next research slide, yeah. 
Um, we were particularly interested to find these past examples of terracotta being used structurally with minimal assistance and infrastructure. Here we see terracotta tiles forming an arch, literally able to hold up a floor slab. And perhaps we're taking a leap here, but we wonder, could this have become a forgotten application due to its tight tolerances? In this case, um, the two parallel steel beams had to be you know, exactly in place to carry these tiles. Um, and since we have new technology today, we wonder if uh, there could be a new home for this old technique. And in our project, we paired that with um, research by Dr. Cardi, um, which was really great to have access to. Um, we think this is the right time to revive this material and acknowledge the necessity to maximize the environmental benefit, reduce waste, and reduce the carbon footprint in the building created by the building industry today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mache. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for the setup. <laughs> So uh, I think in summary, this is probably the most fundamental uh, question of our research. How can we scale up, uh, we'll return to that word in a second, how can we scale up terracotta construction and perhaps in so doing, reintroduce some of these past structural applications? So by scale up, I think I, I mean uh, more specifically moving beyond the facade. So here's a uh, very early sketch of a translation from that initial research into design. And this actually nicely summarizes, I think, a lot of the key ingredients that did follow us through the uh, entire design process. So some things, some key ingredients that you do see here, the this is an extrusion. We were inspired by those initial images of the historic images that use that technology. Uh, part A and part B were necessary. We wanted to have two parts doing this assembly at least, perhaps one actually also. And we did lean toward tensioning as some kind of means to produce a, a singular or monolithic mega panel, if you will. There's this idea about for uh, assembling on the ground, whether that's in some kind of formwork and then leaning up or lifting up to another, uh, to another place. And perhaps working with this tensioning, finding places, are there other uh, places where we could do removals of the material to actually provide some, uh, some, some character, some, some uh, texture. Uh, here's a quick a conceptual model that we use to test the tens tensioning process. So, this is literally holding itself up with, with tensioning. It's just a, a foam model. Uh, we did try a variety of configurations, but really felt that a compressive structure was the most uh, honest and uh, candid uh, exploration of the material. Uh, and this, interestingly, in the semicircular form that you see here, uh, which of course is an inevitable byproduct of having a singular extrusion, uh, we learned that this arch had a theoretical weight limit. That makes sense. And according to our experts at uh, Walter P. Moore, we had exceeded that. So um, it was very clear to us, they, they told us clearly and tactfully that uh, Archie had to lose some weight. <laughs> so um, to that end, we embraced uh, wire cutting. So this was, uh, came a little bit later as a secondary operation. We had ideas about voids in the first place, but this of course was to remove some of that material and uh, importantly, to, to find, this, is, this was kind of a found um, uh, step, but to find lightness within a heavy material. So of course, we work closely with Matter Factory in Boston Valley Terracotta to learn the rules of uh, and constraints of wire cutting. Uh, here's a quick close-up of uh, some of those cutouts that we ended up uh, using in our, our final piece. And again, our goal was to remove as much as possible. Uh, the cutoff of cutoffs, of course, go back into the into the uh, stream of uh, the extruder. Uh, and of course, we did as much as we could without actually structurally compromising um, Archie, which was of course the name of our uh, beloved arch. So um, despite our best efforts to put Archie on a diet, uh, we found that the largest available span to us was, um, was still kind of at an odd and unoccupiable scale. So of course, uh, for the purposes of the exhibition, um, and also because we are architects and we just can't help but uh, think this way, we wanted to find a way, of course, to make Archie occupiable. So um, we kind of scratched our heads and I remember somebody saying, what if we did a pointed arch? Um, so that was immediately like very provocative. Um, we of course had to compare that to a, a catenary arch. Uh, again, achieving a comfortable clear height beneath. Uh, we're uh, very big fans of Studio Gang of uh, taking uh, complicated facts or concepts or st statistics and trying to present those in really clear fashions. Um, and after sort of uh, doing that, with these two options, it became really clear to us that the pointed arch was definitely the winner. It was the most elegant, it had fewer pieces, it had fewer unit types, uh, and also gave us the desired height and, and structural uh, effect. 
Some quick stats uh, for the final arch design. We've got 36 total uh, terracotta pieces here, 18 of A, the large, 18 of B, the small, uh, about 1,000 pounds total. Uh, we do have neoprene gaskets between all the terracotta pieces. Uh, there are, of course, uh, wooden, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but of course there are wooden feet and, um, and uh, keystone. What you don't see here is the, actually, what you, what you can barely see here is the, uh, the Dyneema rope, which is doing the tensioning from the steel pins at the keystone down to the steel pins in the feet. So there is um, uh, an important ingredient here that, that isn't visible, but is doing quite a bit of work. Also worth mentioning, the buildability was also very important to us. Um, we wanted to make sure that even the larger piece was something that could be handled. So uh, I think we were at 41 pounds. Uh, I'm not even sure if I can lift that, but I assume um, two people could lift that. Um, it's uh, also, um, it's worth acknowledging that in pre-COVID times, we uh, had been working, of course, virtually, uh, both internally and across uh, with Lawson Valley Terracotta and Matter Factory and Walter P. Moore. Um, but live sketching, of course, became a very necessary and, and fluid tool. Uh, of course, to collaboratively explore, exchange, and, and even record ideas. Very literally, you're looking at the sampling of our meeting minutes, as we came to call them. Uh, here's a, some quick sketches and looking at some explorations into the, uh, the feet, and we we're exploring how to house some of that tensioning hardware. Uh, what you see on the right there, actually, we ended up not going in that direction. And again, um, explorations in how to bring levity and lightness into the seemingly heavy material. Uh, I should be very clear also that the intent of this presentation is absolutely not to dive into some of the technical side of the arch. Uh, we think that um, this is really intended to give you, this slide here is intended to give you a technical flavor of the, uh, the feet. Um, and also the tensioning in this case, the tensioning apparatus, uh, which we designed to tightly, to tightly um, and snugly uh, bring Archie's posture um, into, uh, into beautiful form. Um, note that we don't show in this image any kind of temporary false work. That is certainly a part of this, uh, of how to stand Archie up. Uh, but if you'd like to learn more about all the steps necessary to build an arch, please be sure to check out the virtual exhibition. Everyone's received that link at this point, uh, where we diagrammatically illustrate the full sequence of events to build an arch. And as you can see, there are exactly six steps to do so. Uh, you'll find in this presentation that there is actually not a single image of an actual arch. So here's a behind the scenes peek at uh, our progress. This is one of the uh, many extruder trials that took place at Matter Factory. So uh, while at, we here at Studio Gang weren't able to get our hands dirty, on, uh, we were actually really excited. I mean this entirely. We were really excited and thankful to learn more about the extrusion process uh, through these failures, through, uh, through Matter Factory. And uh, I, I, again, mean this entirely and earnestly that uh, we, we are profound believers in the learning that happens through, through failures, particularly with material explorations. So uh, I won't do this explanation justice, but uh, let me try. Uh, it, so it turns out that the extents of the profile were a little bit too close to the limits of the extruder beyond, which changes the, this is fascinating, uh, very fascinating, which changes the flow and the memory of the moving clay. Actually, as it's being pushed through the dye, the clay uh, produces eddies and its own currents, kind of like rocks in a turbulent river. So it builds a, a, a bias or a skew into the extrusion. Uh, if you look casually at an extruder, it appears conceptually obvious, right? Like clay plus pressure plus dye equals extrusion. But really, uh, we should all, I think, acknowledge the extraordinary craft and care that goes into every success that we see. So big, big thank you to Andy Brayman and the Matter Factory folks who made the valiant effort to uh, get all these pieces to run and took the time to very carefully explain all the uh, hiccups that they were finding. And also, big, big thank you to John Krause and the experts over at Boston Valley Terracotta for offering to take over this extrusion. I can't tell you how excited we are to get these pieces in our hands and to, um, to give Archie a home here at our Chicago office. Uh, please do check out our website in the coming weeks. We're, we'll be posting images about the construction. So what's next? A couple of peeks at some of the um, other explorations that we are hoping to do in the future. Uh, initially, we had hoped to find, I think, a greater, let's say, constructional mileage out of the uh, tensioning procedure, and in an, that would be in an attempt to obviate the need for temporary false work, which can be, of course, itself uh, quite, quite a lot. Um, but we ultimately found, in, for our case, that we do intend to use uh, conventional ground-up false work, but the tilt-up 
uh, the build on the ground tension tilt up does seem to have a lot of potential that we haven't yet fully exploited. Uh, we would also like to expand our line of research into reciprocal frame structures made of terracotta. This was another angle of research we had entertained, uh, which of course would require, you might say, well, Maciej, that's not going to stand up. It needs some tens tensile reinforcement. And I would say, well, okay, then we should integrate some kind of tensile reinforcement uh, post extrusion, of course. And so Boston Delia Terracotta, uh, if we are invited back next year, uh, we call dibs on post extrusion tensile reinforcement research. And uh, thank you very much. This will be hopefully Archie's uh, home in the future, home on the range, we say. Uh, please do uh, visit us. I should say that this is a semi-public space uh, where we host events, et cetera. So it is possible at some point in the future when we can um, all get together that uh, you could see Archie yourself. Thank you very much. Great, thank, thank you very much. Uh, so um, what, what I'd like to do now is to just ask all the panelists to make themselves visible. I will also make them visible for the, um, for the attendees and maybe we can get started. Uh, to the attendees, if you have questions, please do put them uh, in the chat and, and we can pass those on. So uh, first of all, thank you everyone. The, the work is again, uh, um, thoughtful, exuberant, uh, with really interesting kind of directions. I wanted to maybe sh shift our discussion a little bit in a, in a different way uh, for, for this uh, uh, series, because it isn't uh, the facade that we're doing. We're doing a lot of interiors. We're doing a lot of other, other things with it. Um, one of the things that in a past ACOW uh, uh, came up was, you know, how good is uh, terracotta as a uh, uh, as a collaborator material with other materials. Uh, uh, in other words, it's, it, it works very well, and, and we're sort of seeing some questions, let's say, as to how these other materials, whether it is organic material, living material that has to sort of occupy it, or for that matter, uh, uh, gaskets and other things, uh, or, or as post-tensioning, let's say, in the last presentation. Can you speak a little bit to, you know, I think there's a question of the form, but of course that, that is specific to, let's say, the geometry problem. I, I'm thinking more of the assembly problem. How is your thinking about these assemblies and how these things attach to actually architecture or become architecture themselves? What are some of the challenges that you guys have seen now that you've been working with the material and, and the conversation you've had? Um, Maybe the structures people can take that on first, because I'm sure they're the ones who, Gustav, I'm imagining you probably have a lot to say on that. Yeah, I was, I was waiting to see if, uh, if someone else would pick that up. Um, yeah, so Mar, you're right. Um, we've been involved in various kind of projects uh, with, this, uh, with this great event for, uh, this is the fifth year running now, actually, and have tried, you know, our hand at many, many different ways of kind of treating Treating terracotta both from a sort of material uh, more, uh, I wouldn't say molecular because we don't quite have that ability, but like the material makeup all the way to the assembly logic. And I mean, one, one sort of continual, um, continual uh, red thread, let's say, is always the, um, you know, the way that terracotta traditionally wants to be treated, meaning that it's a compression material, um, and that with varying success, we try to induce bending and, uh, and tension into it, which, you know, the, 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 la the last project here, for instance, would be, a, would be a, an example of that, right? And, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I think that that is, um, that's a very interesting kind of path of exploration that is fairly little, little tried, tried yet. You know, it's not so well-traveled yet, just because it, mm, I mean, I'm not gonna speak for everyone, but in my own experience, maybe that says something about me, it, it fails mainly, most often, right? And after a while, you know, yes, a failed experiment also proves something, but after a while, you also sort of want to get something out of it, right? Um, so I think uh, if I speak to the project that I was myself advising on this year, what I really love about that um, is that we are, we're not necessarily questioning like, you know, what the terracotta um, to, can do kind of with its physical mechanical properties. Um, but we're rather uh, elevating the, you know, like the arena and, and the group mentioned the, first of all, the, the amazing ability to just make shapes the way you want, right? Um, and then to make those shapes do different things uh, uh, in terms of performance, uh, you know, carrying, carrying plants, holding water, um, being semi-translucent for, for that sort of thing. 
Um, and I really, you know, I've really enjoyed that aspect of it, even if it's fully, that piece, if you will, is fully in the architectural realm, you know, it, 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 there's little engineering with it and we advise some kind of, you know, assembly and, uh, and attachment, but we do get to kind of nerd out on things like the full out strength of a Kyle anchor as opposed to a um, traditional rain screen clip. Um, sorry, I digress a little bit, I, but I do think that the, 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 the the big sort of unexplored area still um, is really the to push the limits of kind of the physical, the mechanical properties of the material and the physical performance of it. And I think that's largely un, un, uh, unexplored yet. I think on our end, and somebody actually brought this up um, in the chat, that you have sort of mortaring a system. I think when we were initially developing um, our design, we, we sort of wanted to push it to be uh, to not have any other elements besides maybe a mortar even a you know thought about dry stack and then thought well maybe we could mortar it I mean it was really designed as a brick something that could stand on its own and stack and we'll work with Walter P. Moore to actually um, develop it in that way uh, and then realizing that the mortar was not really feasible for the workshop as we had intended it we shifted to the um, to the custom gasket and hardware system, which actually opened up the, the possibilities of how we developed that negative space, which became a really important part of the project. I mean, as much as we designed the, the module itself, that the in-between space started to become uh, just as much of a design element. So the, the added material, as much as we initially were kind of resisting it, um, really ended up adding an important piece to the, to the process. Uh, so I think it, it opens up possibilities that might not be available if, if uh, we sort of take a more purist approach to it in a way. Well, I mean, now one question I had as, as you were as you were showing that silicon gasket. I mean, silicon probably in terms of its ability to sort of handle that kind of uh, weight and so forth may have let it. 20 years on it, and you're, you have a material that's a good 100-year material there on top of it. I, I'm wondering if, if, if uh, actually its own um, deterioration, uh, did you feel that that would be okay uh, in terms of whether that gasket performs precisely or not? Uh, I think those connections are getting to become more and more interesting, especially when we're looking at uh, these modern systems and this whole question of maybe the, the older systems of putting things together a bit with mortar or stuff were, uh, you know, really had maybe better sensibility for longevity and, and durability. Uh, but, but maybe your, uh, your geometry seemed to be able to stand itself because it was like a dry stack, right? That even if there was a collapse, it wasn't going to collapse. It would just sort of, you know, get tighter uh, or something. That's a really interesting comment because, um, Certainly, like Guastavino, his tile work is structural. Um, and so I think in the conversation about structure and terracotta, I'm kind of with Gustav in that there are limits to terracotta and playing to those limits might not be a bad thing. However, if there was an argument to be made for um, limiting the amount of aluminum connections in order to not use as much aluminum, because we all know that's dangerous, um, looking forward, I would be interested in that. Um, like, how can you minimize the number of connections? I'm not sure. We haven't studied that, but we, I would love to. Well, I think, yeah, there, oh, sorry, um, sorry. Um, Darina, that's, that, I love that. Um, one, of the, um, one of the pieces of research uh, before we kind of initiated our uh, kind of material research, so the historical side of it, that um, was never quite answered, but I'd be really curious to know if anybody this might tie into that a little bit, and I'd be curious to know if there's anybody out there that knows more about this, but uh, we were trying to find uh, more information on the reasons why some of these structural applications became less favored. We did find some that were a little bit more obvious, but some that we really couldn't explain. We touched on that lightly regarding the tolerances of some of the, uh, some of the surrounding infrastructure, if you will, to accept the terracotta pieces, but one clue to that might be to uh, why historically they didn't, uh, we, we, they seem to have dropped out of favor to the facade. And of course, we again, like we know that they make a lot of sense in both applications, but uh, why do we only see them on the facade now, uh, by and large? I think to some of the, the, the points, and Omar, your point in particular about the durability material, uh, one intent in, the, in trying to think through how could the system actually be more of a standalone system without needing some of these extra pieces, was that 
we did imagine it as something that could stand out in in nature. I mean, looking at the, some of the rock walls, the moss covered rock walls that inspired some of our thinking. Um, there was, I think, maybe a, a notion that in an idealized setting, if we could figure out how to do this, you could actually build this as as one of those walls and let nature kind of take over and start to fill in those cavities and provide the uh, the glue that would hold it together. So, I mean, that's kind of looking at a much longer time span of it. Uh, but I think that was something that was th the ideal version of it would have would have been that uh, in a way. Yeah, no, that, that that's that actually speaks to duration and longevity in an interesting and, and nice way it would evolve. Uh, just uh, just speaking a bit to to Maciej's uh, question, you know, uh, initially it was really the the fireproofing qualities of of terracotta that was the the attraction. So for the large the, the tall skyscrapers, was to protect the, uh, 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 the, the 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 metal, and and that's why it was structural. And we see that still, you know, a lot in in the buildings of the 50s, and so as kind of fireproofing. Uh, 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 partitions and stuff, but but yes, as it uh, I guess as as we began to become uh, more modern, uh, yeah, it just lost its uh, fancy, just was too ornamental and so on. Uh, but uh, but uh, but I I, uh, I think it, uh, it was PLP who sort of brought up, of course, this whole question of now the facade as a potential fire. We we saw this terrible thing happen, of course, in London with the fire with the fire going up uh, on the facade. Uh, this uh, is one of uh, another really interesting quality that we haven't really explored in ACAL about fire and fireproofing as a kind of uh, phenomena that that uh, terracotta is actually. Uh, a really great uh, material to sort of uh, uh, work with. Are there any questions you guys have for each other? I'll just say uh, this isn't a question so much as like a, a kudos. Um, I was I was very much impressed with the um, the uh, alignment of your tool paths um, for um, uh, the the different mold pieces of the molds that came together. So I, I want to acknowledge that I, I know how difficult that such things can be. So uh, heads off. I believe that was um, from Mena. I think you uh, spoke about that portion of it. Yes, thank you. It, it, uh, I think somebody mentioned, I think Andy mentioned how uh, things that look really simple or straightforward, yes. that there's actually so much more that goes behind them. This is one of those cases where we spent way longer than you would imagine developing those alignments. And, and we didn't actually, we basically had one shot to do it. We couldn't really test it because we had limited access to the LMN facilities um, given all the COVID restrictions. So we sort of had to get it all done, kind of imagine like, okay, this is gonna work. You think it's gonna work, go in there and just like hope. Uh, so, and, and thank you. I mean, Andy has a tremendous amount of work to then make all that happen because at the end of the day, he gets these separate pieces and he has to fit them all together and really do that final detailing. So uh, work very closely with him on that collaboration. Great. Uh, well, uh, with that, um, I'd like to really thank you all for uh, a wonderful panel. Um, 